Hey everyone, it's George Coase and welcome back to another monthly edition of the Best of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. And as always, I had absolutely incredible guests. I learned a ton and they really made a positive impact on me. And as I was thinking about the intro for today's you know monthly highlight reel, I wanted to share a quick story just about something that happened last night. Um, I read this quote and it's from the John Maxwell Daily Reader. I just love it because I you know, don't necessarily read it every day, but I can pick it up any day and find something inspirational, something that makes me think. And it had this story and it was basically the idea of be a thermostat, not a thermometer. And just kind of thinking about that, a thermometer can gauge the temperature, tell you what it is, but a thermostat can change it. And are we those people in the lives of others? And just a little thing can change the environment that we're around through our actions. And here's something I was thinking about. Even last night, this this happened after um, before I actually read that quote. My daughter, Kalia, I picked her up from dance and she wasn't, you know, there's something off. There's something bugging her and I, I don't know what it was. And I honestly think sometimes we just have moods. We're just nothing happened. We're just having a rough day. So I asked her as I'm driving her back home, like, what's up? What's going on? How are you doing? She's like, no, I'm fine. I said, are you sure? She's like, yeah. And you could tell she's grumpy, but she didn't want to talk about it. So I kind of left it, came home, ate dinner, and she kind of went to her room alone and she was struggling. I could tell that. So I could assess because a thermostat can still assess the temperature, right? So I went up to her room and I said, hey, do you want to go for a walk? Didn't ask her about anything or like, what's up? Why are you doing this? Because it's not typical for her just to go be by herself. I said, do you want to go for a walk? She's like, yeah, I actually do. So her and I start getting on her stuff to go for a walk. And my other daughter, Georgia, was excited about that. So she wanted to go for a walk too. She joined us. So Kalia took the stroller. She pushed Georgia. And they just had a blast and just had an awesome time doing this little walk and they were smiling and Cleo was smiling and Georgia was smiling. And do you know what we talked about on that walk? Nothing, nothing at all. We didn't talk about anything. And I think sometimes we, we always want to dig in and learn more. And sometimes we just, people just need to know we were there and we care. And that sometimes just being there is enough to change the temperature. Yeah, I said something was going on, but I also understood she just didn't feel like talking. And sometimes prying can make things worse. And I know sometimes when I'm in a bad mood, I just I just need to know people care. I don't need you to dig in. I don't need to talk about things. We're always like, we need to talk about, let her feel it. You got to feel it. No, no, no. Sometimes it just, just let me be. Just let me be. And I could read that in my daughter. And what is interesting is that taking that moment to just invite her for a walk, not talk about things, change the mood, and then her mood changed my daughter, George's mood. They're both just happy, and they went to bed, and both of them just had the best of days. And so when we do something that affects a person close to us in a positive way, often what happens is they affect people around them as well. So that's that idea of be a thermostat, not a thermometer. Just something I was thinking about, wanted to share with you all. And you'll get a lot of more wisdom from, probably a lot more wisdom than I can offer you from my wonderful guests. So I hope you enjoy this episode of the Best of the Innovators Mindset Podcast for the month of March. Thanks for watching. Have a great day. I think I talked about this in interviews mindset is that when you talk about leadership, sometimes that's being in the front, sometimes that's being on the side and sometimes that's being behind, right? Actually knowing. And, uh, when I looked at who I hired, I never tried to hire George clones. I didn't want to hire people like me. I wanted to hire people who complimented me and had strengths that I didn't have because I would need that. And then there's a really important aspect of this. If you hire people that have strengths that you don't have, then you better also be comfortable stepping aside when that when those things you know come up and those things happen because sometimes you put those people in those positions to lead, but then when you know it gets down to it, you step in front of them even though they have the expertise, right? And you have to like I think great leaders know when to like 
be from the back, right? And like, just be behind and say like, hey, you're you're the expert on this. You, you need to lead. And yeah, so when sure. we were talking about this before, and this ties in beautifully to this, you were talking about the shared leadership framework, something that you're really passionate about. So tell us like, what, what do you mean when you say a shared leadership framework and how does that actually look like in your school? So can you, um, can you imagine what that feels like when you have the trust of your administrator that you, that, that they know that they um, trust you to implement whatever it is that we've been asked to do. And so empowering teachers with understanding of, of whatever we're doing and then allowing them to lead there, we're building the capacity for shared leadership, not just in one classroom, but in multiple classrooms. So I guess what, what I'm really excited about and what, what it really drives me is what can I do as a leader to empower teachers with what they need to know and be able to do? And I know I mentioned that before, but it's right. it's really true. It's like, I'm not sure I'm answering your question right, but shared leadership really has provided us with a platform to build the capacity of understanding for teachers in, in independently and as teams in order to further the momentum of student learning. And so I always think about, you know, what does that feel for a teacher that my principal is um, entrusting me to um, do this thing and to do it well and to share my knowledge with other colleagues. I want to retain my teachers. I want to, I want to have them stay here for a long time. And so I can't do everything. And so I need to count on them to do these other things and giving them the um, permission to, or empower to, to do that. I can only imagine what that feels like as a teacher to have that trust of your administrator. So I try to give that trust to them when I can and to build their, um, faith in themselves, um, faith in what they're doing and belief in what they're doing. You know, what we talk about that mind shift, that mind belief, you know, what I want them to experience that and feel that. And then the most important thing is when I see it, I celebrate it. Right. It's like, let's stop, let's stop just for a second. Did you see what you just did? Did you see the impact it had on the, your students in the classroom? It just happened yesterday. I watched a teacher in our newcomers program and she, it was an area of strength for her. And the feedback that I gave her, it's like, you taught me this, this, and this. Can you share that with your colleagues? I, I can't wait to hear what that conversation was about because this was an area of strength that I saw in you. And our kids were, were blossoming under that instruction. And that's just a small example of, of what one leader can do is to recognize mm -hmm. it, to celebrate it, and to, to, to build that capacity for understanding and, and sharing the the load a lot of conversation about chat gpt artificial intelligence and one of the arguments i've made is that there's a lot of people that all of a sudden are chat gpt experts i'm like you're not a chat gpt expert right mm -hmm. but what i think really the misconception is that there's a lot of people that are really good at learning and as the title of your book adaptable adapting to new situations right figuring out and one of my favorite quotes from you aj goes along the lines and you'll correct me on this because i'm not going to say it perfectly right is that we don't need to prepare students for something, but we need pre to prepare students for anything, right? What's a quote from you? What is it? How is it? Yeah, our job as teachers, as parents, is not to prepare students first, it's to help them prepare themselves for anything, right? So they should be the ones preparing themselves for the future. Right. And so I love that quote from you. And I think it's a really important aspect because that is something that I've been arguing for a long time nobody knows what the future holds in education. And so people are making these like focuses on whatever. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of misconception that it doesn't mean kids shouldn't read or anything like this, blah, blah, blah. I think that's such a terrible argument. It's actually building beyond that. Of course we want kids to read, but we also want them to be able to adapt to new situations because if you're not willing to do that, you're going to become irrelevant at some point. And the only way to not become irrelevant is to be able to willing to continuously grow, which is the business of schools, in my opinion, or it should be at least. So when you're looking at chat GPT, AI, what's maybe some of the opportunities that you see for educators right now utilizing some of these things and maybe not just in their learning, but even in their own personal lives? Yeah, I think first and foremost, it's just a reality that is going to continue to impact us right now and in the future. It's already impacting us, but even more so, right, in the coming months and years and that type of thing. The big shift for me is that we've always had the ability to access information. Now we have this ability for creative outlets, and that's the game changer, right? So we always could go to Google and get the information to write a paper 
but we had to synthesize it. We had to break it down. We had to recap, evaluate all that kind of stuff. Now we can just have an AI write that paper. They do all the synthesizing and creative output themselves. Given that reality, and it is impacting all kinds of fields, I think we have to take a deep look at how we assess. So for example, if you're a math teacher, and you give a math test and you only assess getting the final question right, getting the actual answer, right. you can use a calculator, they can use photomath, they can do anything, you're not really assessing the learning. Same thing goes for being an English teacher, a humanities teacher, you assign a writing and they use ChatGPT. That isn't what learning should be about. That's not what assessment should be about. So I think it's calling on a lot of people to change a little bit of their practices of how we assess learners and actually looking at the learning process. So how people can use it is in so many different ways. I've seen teachers already using it for lesson plans, using it for smart goals, for IP modifications and accommodations, all kinds of things that would take them a lot of time. And this is giving them ideas or starting points. I've seen students using it for starting points of their college essay, for writing scripts and video and storyboards for things they're gonna create it's like the best study, research, or partner to any project you've ever had because they're always going to be there and they're always going to give you feedback and ideas along the way. And I think that's how we should view it as an assistant to the learning process, not someone who's just going to replicate. Yeah. And that, that but AJ, it's not like we're going to be just carrying calculators in our pockets. <laughs> exactly. Right? You're not just going to be carrying calculators in our pockets. That's like the schools that have blocked it. I understand. Immediately. You know, it may not be COPA compliant, but it's on the kids' phones. You can't block it on there. Can you tell us a little bit about, and I asked you if this is okay uh, mm -hmm. before, can you tell us a little bit about the, you know, that you work part time, you know, contracting, you speak part time. I, and I, you know, like I, I say part time, like these are all things mm -hmm. you do. Plus, you work with a district. Because I know a lot of people, um, wish they had that opportunity. And I work with a lot of people that basically the district says to you, we want you a hundred percent of the time or 0% of the time. Like you have to make mm -hmm. a decision and it seems pretty, you know, amazing that people have the vision, you know, to, to kind of give you some of that flexibility. Now I will be honest with you, if you're a classroom teacher, it's a little bit harder if you're around yeah. kids every single day. Um, but when you work in like a central office position, it's a little bit different because Sometimes you have to do paperwork and that sucks, but you can do paperwork on a plane, right? Yeah. And that's reality. So like, how, how does that work for you? Like how, how is juggling, you know, the, the, the multiple roles, um, but still, you know, honoring your district. Yeah. I'm super grateful for my district for giving me that flexibility, but I think most importantly, valuing me as a leader, as an educator, and knowing that when I go and when I speak and when I go to conferences, I'm going to be bringing back that value to my district. And that is not something that is going to go to waste. I mm -hmm. am continuously learning, not only from going to sessions, but just as you know, those connections, those people oh. that you talk to over meals or you talk to in the hallway, you get to dive deeper into maybe what they do and some of the, the issues and the problems that you're tackling in your own districts, you're able to kind of talk those things through. And so my perspective has changed so much over the years as I have become connected on social media, but as I have been able to go out and be able to be a part of, of these conferences and speaking engagements. And so um, my district has seen that I have these opportunities to speak and they really have valued um, my time and, mm -hmm. and me as a leader in saying, you know what, we, we will have you 50% and we will also let you do 50% what you need to do with Canvas for Education, speaking, whatever it might be. And we trust you that you are going to give us your 50% and you're going to, to work that out. And so I do have kind of days that I clock in in the district. Um, and there are days where I have to flex that a little or weeks that I have to flex that a little bit, but it's worked out really, really well. And it's allowed me to be able to just be able to work in all of my passion areas. There's so many things that I love to do and I love to get to share my message and my heart for education. And so having that flexibility has just really enabled me to do that. And 
And I know that it's rare and I'm so, so grateful right. it for is it. Rare. Mm -hmm. It is rare. And, and the, you know, as, as you're talking, the, the one thing we were kind of talking about before the podcast, the reality of it is when you are working for a district and you have that role, one of the things that I found, cause I had something very similar, you know, I was like, 0.9, mm -hmm. 0 0.8, 0 0.5, 0 0.2, you know, that kind of that role. But I would go to these events where I was invited to speak or do workshops, whatever. And that was, you know, my day. That wasn't a district day. That was, mm -hmm. that was my day. But what was really powerful is that I'm a learner and I pick up great ideas from these amazing yeah. people that my district paid zero dollars for. Right. Yeah. And and then all of a sudden I take those ideas, bring them back, modify them to my district. And they benefit as opposed to them paying for me to go to a conference and stuff like that too. And right. when you say, when you say, you know, um, here, here's, here's the other part and I'm making an assumption here. I guarantee you that even though you have X amount of hours that you're expected to put in, I guarantee you put in more and probably part of it, you know, maybe doing stuff on the side for your district, re, you know, doing extra stuff because you feel that value. You want to make sure that yeah. you kind of go above and beyond the expectation, not just like, Hey, sorry, Hey, you can't talk to me until I show up on Monday, right? Like that's my district time. And I think a lot of people don't realize that because if you, if people feel really valued through that process, they, they go above and beyond, but when they're kind of diminished and, you know, I, I think they're like, I, I just wish more districts would be open to that because I, you know, they, it is kind of fascinating people that kind of hundred percent or zero, as opposed to like, Hey, can we benefit from this person? Um, Part of it too, because they have they bring such value to our district, but right. also really inspire them. Just the way we, you know, want kids to have some flexibility in those options as well. So, hundred percent, yeah, yeah. So good, good for your district. It's not about getting to that place where we find happiness. It's actually when we learn to enjoy the process, and that doesn't mean enjoy that we're always happy, nothing's ever hard, but really finding joy in the daily opportunities that we have to make our lives better. And so what I appreciate about Ruben sharing about this in the book is that it's not that you shouldn't have goals. It's not that you shouldn't have endpoints, but it's really finding that joy in the process connected with one another. And so this is what she shares about that. But the arrival fallacy doesn't mean that pursuing goals isn't a route to happiness. To the contrary, the goal is necessary just as is the process toward the goal. Friedrich Nietzsche explained it well. The end of a melody is not its goal. But nonetheless, if the melody has not reached its end, it would not have reached its goal either. A parable. To enjoy now, there is something else I was going to have to master. My dread of criticism. So just thinking about that, really learning to love that process. And when I think about this professionally, and especially now, a lot of people are applying for jobs that they might have wanted. They're having that time of year where we're looking at maybe leaving the places that we're in. I've shared this story before. Really, when I became assistant principal, I had no intention of becoming assistant principal. And basically day two, I'm like, I want to be a principal. That's something I really enjoyed or I really wanted to do. And I started getting really focused on that. And as I got focused on that process, I started ignoring my current situation, how awesome it was because I was just shooting for that next phase in my life. And when I started to realize that I really need to be present where I'm at. And if I do that really well, that principalship will come. And it's not that I don't have that goal, but I feel that sometimes we lose the present in search of the future. I think, you know, a lot of this has changed um, so quickly. So, you know, a lot of people, it is uh, March when this is, um, is being public or, you know, is being broadcast to the world. And so we're kind of going into that, you know, there's maybe a break. <laughs> there's maybe a break and then we're like you know at the end where we're like mm -hmm. man these kids i'm like well sometimes it's us as adults too like we're kind of done right. we're kind of done for the year too so right like, as people go into the end of the year that that final stretch what's a piece of advice yeah you could give them as they're kind of looking to and i'll end the year on a you know a positive note um for themselves and for their students i think one thing that's always kind of just allowed me to stay focused um, and to finish strong during the school year is school year is just to, um, for me to realize that this scholar only goes to this grade one time. Right. And so every, every day they only get this one day in, in fifth grade, sixth grade, fourth grade, whatever grade that scholar may be in one time. 
So we have to make the best of it. We have to finish strong. And once we're finished, you know, we're finished, but we have to, we have to just realize that they only get one of these in their lifetime, right? So we have to give it all we got this one time for them. Now it may look different because we have to go back and do it all again, but not with that particular scholar. And mm-hmm. so I think if we hold on to that, you know what I'm saying? It keeps just what we do new and just fresh and to realize, you know what I'm saying? I would never get this opportunity with the same scholar again. So let me give it all I got and let me finish strong. And so I think that, um, or even when I deal with trainings or, or teachers, I may, I will not get the same opportunity again with this person. So in this moment, I'm gonna give it everything that I have, and I'm gonna finish strong. So hopefully that encourages you <laughs> to finish the school you're strong. Yeah, I love that. that's such good, and that's yeah. true, right? Like that. It, this is it. Mm-hmm. This is our only year mm-hmm. in grade three. This is it. This yeah. is our only yeah. year in grade three. So I love that. <laughs>